Hello, everybody. This is State Rep Noreen Kokoruda. Um, hopefully, hopefully, you'll get to see this video. We'll be showing it over the next week or so. Um, today, I've invited um, Fran Rubinowitz. Fran is the executive director of the Connecticut Association of Public Schools Superintendent of Schools. So she really oversees the whole state with our superintendents. And I've asked Fran to come today um, to talk to us about the school issues that you're all talking about, you know, the reopening, um, you know, where it is now, where it's going, what's the state doing, obviously um, with sports, what's going on with sports in our state, a lot of questions from parents, and then also our special ed, um, what is the status of that and what, what they're seeing statewide and what we can hopefully look forward to in the future. So Fran, I'd like to welcome you to, uh, you, to Madison and Durham. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me, Noreen. I, um, I always look for an opportunity to be able to communicate with, um, with, the, with any community because I know this is such a challenging time for everyone. You know, Fran, you're so right. And I know as a, a local, very local person, as I talk to people that are involved as parents, students, but even my Board of Ed members, what a tough, tough decision to have made um, to make, you know, never make everyone happy. It's such a big deal. It's very important. So um, I'm so glad you're here today to really, really let people understand what, what's really going on with reopening and what, what hopefully we can expect is with, with what we know right now. Um, and so let me begin by saying, you know, what we've been working on um, statewide. I meet with um, probably about 100 superintendents a week because I go to all the area groups, um, certainly often to the Madison group, um, which meets with LEARN, and um, groups throughout the state. And the issue is um, there's so much ambiguity. Do you know what I mean? We're yes. used to planning. We like to plan and have all of our ducks in a row and be ready to begin school on that first day with the best experience for every child. And this um, COVID-19 has certainly presented such a challenge to us because we have to follow the health data and it, it changes. And we are in Connecticut, thankfully, in a very different place than most of the nation. We're in a place where it is safe to reopen schools, but much of the public hears the national news and all of the issues surrounding um, opening of schools in Georgia or Florida, for instance, which is very different from here. So we're combating that all of the time. I would say to you that right now, the majority of schools are opening in a hybrid model. What that means is they're bringing in half of the children on Monday and Tuesday. They're all going distance learning and doing deep cleaning on Wednesday. And they're bringing in the other half on Thursday and Friday. That is a generalization, but I would say that most school districts, some, are um, fortunate enough to be able to social distance the children enough so that they can bring in all of the children, K-5 at least, and keep the others on a hybrid. I would say for the most part, what I'm hearing is most are hybrid. Um, most are thinking that they're opening hybrid with the aspiration of going full um, in October, if our, if our numbers remain low. I would also say that the other thing is schools, when they reopen in hybrid or if they open in full for elementary, I would say to you that schools will not look like they looked in 2019. Our classrooms look very, very different. Um, you know, when we welcome a kindergarten child or a first grader in, you know those classrooms. Teachers spend hours and hours decorating the classrooms. They have nooks and crannies and um, rocking chairs and rugs and all of that. None of that will be present. Um, it will be 
quite a sterile environment um, with the children facing one way, certainly everyone in masks, which will need some, some work with the kids because it's going to be brand new and different to them and brand new and different to teachers. For the last 20 years, what we have done is worked in groups with children. You know, you walk into a classroom, you see four desks um, pushed together with children working interactively. You will not be seeing that as schools um, open. Um, the other piece of that is that while group A is in on Monday and Tuesday, group B will be at home watching the class. Um, cameras are being installed in most classrooms, um, you know, and through the computer, they will be watching the streaming of the classroom at home. And then on Wednesday, it will be the entire class together on online, and then Thursday and Friday, the second half of class. It's not ideal. What can I say? It is not ideal. We don't love it. We don't love any of the scenarios, um, but we're trying to do the best we can, keeping in mind that the health and safety of the children is, and, and our staff is number one. You know, it's interesting you, you, you said that because I didn't realize, so the kids that are home, what they've done in Madison, I know at the high school, you have an A group and a B group, and it's yeah. by, by, by last, your last name, alphabetical. Um, so the kids that are in the B group for Thursday and Friday won't be doing dis different distance learning. They will be watching a class. Yes, they will be watching the class. And, um, and then on Thursday and Friday, they'll be in right. and the A group will be watching the class. That, now, well, that would be in the younger grades too? The, I'm talking yes. The first and second grade the same way? Yes, yes. All of the grades. And what we're hoping is that there will be some funding for all districts to provide some extra help in that because... You know, streaming is new for us as well. It's the best way we can think of to do what we need to do. But um, it is, um, you know, it's still streaming. It's still not the teacher in person. So we're hoping that we can have some additional interventionists to work with children um, at home. You know, Fran, here in Madison and Durham, I would think that most children, majority, do have access to the internet, to computers, Chromebooks. What has the state done for, you know, a few months ago, we were hearing that there were children that still didn't have Chromebooks in some of our urban areas. Is that better or what, what are they, how are they addressing that? What have they done? Well, I think that first of all, the Dalio Foundation, um, even though the partnership didn't work, the Dalio Foundation is still very much at work and they are doing, um, they have donated um, and funded uh, 60,000 Chromebooks. Um, the governor has found funding for 50,000 more. So there are 110,000 um, 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 oh, wow. Chromebooks out there, which is incredibly helpful. But remember, 42% of our kids are in alliance districts. Those are districts that are low socioeconomic. That means probably about 300, 350,000 kids. And so we are concerned that um, not everyone, not everyone is going to have the devices that they need um, or the connectivity that they need, even though they've worked very hard on it it is not going to be perfect. I'm hopeful that it will be better than the spring, but I know that I can't guarantee, and I don't think anyone can, that every child will be connected. And that's worrisome. Um, you know, it's been six months for many of those children that they have not had um, any engagement with school. You know, I was on a call earlier, and I believe you, you were one of the panelists, and um... I know they were saying, first of all, just the internet capability is an issue they're yep. working on, but, but they also said they were having trouble actually of finding these kids, really yes. getting it to help them. Hopefully that's better. Now, that was a few couple months ago. I'm um, sure that's yes. changed. Um, and I'm hopeful that that is better, and I'm hopeful that individual districts have done um, surveys, gone out to homes, et cetera, to make sure 
that they have all those children um, counted, but also know that the children have had Chromebooks for six months at home. You and I both know how, how kids are. They're not exactly the most gentle people with um, equipment. And so you've also got to deal with how many of those Chromebooks are in good shape right now. And right. how, you know, so anyway, um, that is um, a couple of the things that that districts are dealing with. And I am, um, I'm very grateful. I'm just giving you my opinion here, but I'm very grateful that at least um, in the majority of districts, I only know of one that's going remote. The majority of the districts are going to at least have some physical interaction with teachers in the beginning of the year. I'm hopeful that we can go to full, but if we go to remote, at least those children will have established a relationship with their teacher. And I do think that that is incredibly important. Nothing's more effective than right, right. in-person learning. You know, I think that was something that confused people when I talked to parents in my town, because we had heard early on that our numbers were so good in Connecticut. I mean, I, I think the governor's done a great job with leading that. Um, but the numbers were so good in Connecticut, I think people were expecting, uh, you know, full coming back to school. And I think they were surprised when that sort of went in the opposite direction. Was there something in that decision that, that, that seemed to have changed at some point? Well, I think that what we were hoping was that everyone would be able to come back. Um, but, and the numbers are one thing and those are immensely important and the DPH will be releasing those every week. But that's not the only piece that um, is important. The other piece that has been somewhat of a barrier um, certainly is physical distancing. Being able to keep the kids at an optimum of six feet, but at least three feet apart. And many schools, especially new schools, guys, uh, don't have um, the um, larger classrooms that are able to accommodate that for all children. That was, um, that was part of the reason for the, um, the change to hybrid. Honestly, uh, we've been working on it since March. We wanted all the kids back. I mean, we understand, while I don't subscribe to the to the belief that schools are daycares. We also are reality based and understand that people need to work. Um, and it's important that they know that their children are safe um, and taken care of. We would, uh, the superintendents would have liked nothing more in the world than to open um, with all children in the fall. But you know, safety and health being the two prime considerations we needed to, most needed to go this route. You know, thank you for that, because that explains it, because I think people are thinking, well, our numbers needed to stay here, and they did, and now we're changing it, but you're exactly right, and even those, yes. old, those of us with old buildings, a lot of our old buildings, um, you know, we've been closing schools, so we don't have access to a, you know, we've been consolidating, I think a lot of towns have, and then also, we were hearing concerns about buses and getting there and everything. And I know uh, people offered to drive their children, but you know, all the, these, these schools are in little residential areas. I can't imagine what the traffic would be like every morning with you having, you know, 85% or whatever of the t of, of parents driving. It sounds fine, but when you look at the really details, it would be, uh, it would be amazing to be able to accomplish that traffic wise, unless we, really put a plan up of rotating times or really changing things. So, so that physical distancing really, really, I didn't think of it. That's, that's, thank you for that. Um, yes. So anyway, one of the things you brought up um, when we were talking earlier was, um, um, well, also, me before I go to that, you talked about this being reassessed in October. Is there like a deadline they're looking at or what no, I, there's this? not, you know, the state has not set any deadline, but um, I've looked at many plans and most districts that are going hybrid are aspiring to go to full. They're not aspiring to go to remote. We're hoping our numbers stay low, that we figure this out, and they're hoping 
that they will be able to um, spread out, especially at the K six or K five level and mm -hmm. spread out and go to full at, um, at some point in time. Um, you know, ideally, in my opinion, not just my opinion, and the limited research that is out there right now, the remote learning has been most difficult on our very young children and on our students with disabilities. So we would like to accommodate them in whatever way possible um, with in-person learning. And I think, I think that it will just take some time to get our staff back in. We have a lot of anxiety on the part of staff. Get everybody back in and um, with the hope that within um, eight to 10 weeks, we can open um, fully. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be amazing? I know other it's states amazing. that have opened um, have seen some problems. I've heard, I really don't know, I have any data on it. But I know one state talked about having problems, but their problems were that they identified kids before they got into the school buildings that you know, potentially you know, had fevers or whatever. And that's the way it should work. So I didn't see this that, that as a problem. I, I really saw it as, a, as the system working the way it was supposed to. Yeah, I think that we've seen a, um, a rise in um, pediatric cases since schools have opened in Georgia and Florida, but I'm not, I'm not certain. I'm not reading that they have been um, incredibly um, careful about every child and staff member wearing a mask and um, keeping the social distance. And so that's a learning for us. We know right. that those things are important. I just can imagine a, you know, a th second grade boy going to school, sitting in an assigned seat. Um, and really they're gonna be up, Beth, eat their lunch there, I understand. And, yes. and limitations with what they can do. I mean, it's one thing to ask, I have granddaughter in high school, um, you know, she's definitely capable of doing all this, but boy, for a little seven-year-old boy to be expected to sit in a seat for X amount, you know, of time and eat his lunch there and that, it's going to be a, quite a change. I think it's, um, and I, oh. I think we're counting on our teachers to really, really be able to, to really make it interesting. We're so lucky that they're so invested in this. Thank goodness for our teachers. They are amazing. And I have no doubt they'll come up with very creative and wonderful ways I have two grandson, I have five grandchildren, but I have two that are in school, 11 and eight. And um, God bless the teacher because trying mm -hmm. to keep them um, involved in um, and engaged in this type of environment will not be easy. One, th one positive thing that I would share is that many of the schools that opened this summer for summer school for students with disabilities um, were pleasantly surprised at how well the um, children reacted to masks. Um, they great. wore them and they're, our kids are really resilient, you know, and I think we're gonna have to plan mask breaks, et cetera, um, for our children and make use of the outside. Thank you, that's, that's so true. One of the things you brought up prior to us starting this video um, was uh, the sports. And obviously the small town, well, every school, sports and, and even music programs, but sports are a big deal. And we're hearing, um, you know, cancellations, we're hearing limit, limitations. What are, what are you hearing is the latest and and what the, what's going on in Connecticut? Well, I just this morning, I met with my um, board and I met with um, Glenn Lingerini, who is the executive director for CIAC. Um, Superintendents are not taking a stand on sports. Um, some are in favor of having the sports begin this fall. Some are um, very wary of the sports beginning this fall. Um, but we have asked Glenn um, to really take a close look at the health data and for the Department of Public Health to weigh in on it. Um, we do know that um, the that UConn uh, the the major sport on the table right now of course is football oh, right. and um, UConn has canceled their season um, the Big Ten college sports have ca canceled their fall sports so you know I'm working hand in hand with 
Glenn. But again, it's got to be a health decision. Um, I don't feel competent as a former superintendent to make that call. I think we need our um, Department of Health to help us with that. You know, I think in the spring, um, Glenn was very unpopular with his decisions to cut spring sports. But I think now we look back, it was certainly the right thing to do. Yes, and I'm it sure, was. And I'm, sure, and I'm sure he did work for the Department of Health. Um, it is all about health and safety, of course. It is health and safety. It's not, um, it's not a decision that superintendents should be making. We're not doctors. Do you have, do you have any information on the, the other side of that with the whole music programs? Towns like Madison, we have incredible choirs and incredible show, show, um, show choirs and plays. Oh, What's I know. And, you know, um, that has gotten far less notice than football. Right. And it is a lifesaver for many children and certainly um, um, enhances education in any way possible. So I sit on a statewide committee with um, the Department of Health. There is guidance that is coming forward very shortly um, on, um, from DPH on um, both choral music and instrumental programs. Well, I noticed my uh, show choir, which is very competitive to get in, um, did their tryouts virtually. And it was, we, a few of us got to see part of it and it was um, pretty interesting. And kids, yes. that have been through, and kids that have been through this, the upperclassmen said, actually, this is better. Well, I wasn't as nervous as doing it in person, but so there's yes. always a silver lining, but I'll be anxious to see uh, where that goes, music, um, programs, all the arts are so yes. important for so many children. And you're right, we talk more about sports. Yeah, um, but, absolutely. But, uh, I, I, I can't remember the numbers, Fran, but one time I looked at the amount of children in Madison that are involved in some sort of music, either with instruments, you know, band, orchestra, chorus, choral groups. It's amazing how what a high percentage, especially at the high school level. It's, um, it's wonderful. And then I wanted to end with the special education part. Um, I actually think, I have a grandson, as you know, on the spectrum, and I, yep. I felt the distance learning from listening to his family, his mother and father and sisters just didn't work for him. Obviously, socialization is a big deal for them. Um, also, all the specialists that he's been lucky enough to work with during the day, all that went away. And um, um, what I, and I think I talked to you earlier, and you said across the state they're seeing, but what have we learned, and where do you think we're going with special ed? Well, Here's what I know we've learned. I know that we've learned that um, the distance learning or remote learning um, does not work very well with um, students with disabilities, especially students that are um, autistic or um, very involved. Um, we have some, we've learned some new strategies, but still, it is nowhere near as effective as those children being in person. And we know that, we've talked about it, we've, um, we've um, discussed it with many, many different audiences. I think that you will see in a majority of districts, um, those students that are very involved, I'm not talking about students that may have a very slight speech impediment or that type of thing, but I'm talking about the involved special ed students. I think you will see them in, um, in classrooms um, four days a week. Um, and to the extent um, possible, they <laughs> will be bringing them in far more often um, than, um, than the regular population. Um, you know, obviously with the um, family's consent, but I, <laughs> I do hear that there are uh, more accommodations being made for them. That is so great to hear because, you know, um, I've always seen that whenever, whenever they're not in school, you do see re them regress more than I think a typical student. And um, it's just, just really good to hear. Of course, the numbers too are limited. These, a lot of these children are used to having an aid in school. So they're not, and so a, a trained aid. And to yes. all of a sudden be in a program and, um, and not, not be getting that help and the parents helping out as much as they can. But, it, but as we've said, with their limited uh, experience, plus a lot of them are working full time themselves. So yes, um, I'm so, so happy to hear when I spoke to you earlier and voiced my concerns about what was happening here in Madison. And you said to me, it's all over the state. 
not that I wished it on everybody, but it made made me know that it wasn't something we were doing wrong. It was really, really just the, the population just needs special considerations. Absolutely. And and that population will get spe special consideration kindergarten through grade 12. Um, and so I think that will be a good move forward. And certainly Madison um, has done good work um, and they're dealing with the same challenges we're dealing with statewide. I know from talking to my board members, this has been such a heart-wrenching um, whole, whole, whole ordeal to go through. And they wanted to do the right thing, obviously. Many of them have children in the school system themselves, but all of them wanted to do what's right. And I think that statewide um, sounds like we've come up with the best solution at the time. And as you said, it's not perfect. It Fran, is, is there not. anything else that we should know? Anything else? No, I, I think I just am grateful to you, Noreen, to have the opportunity. Um, and I am more than happy to, um, to talk about any of the issues at any time. I, it, you know, when you talk about a silver lining, this, the silver lining for me has been um, usually when I'm in person, I see maybe 15 superintendents a week in person, but now I'm seeing a hundred a week um, online. And, you know, in a certain sense, it's just wonderful because I'm really getting a broad spectrum of what is um, going on out there. How much um, dedication and commitment on the part of not just superintendents, but on all of our staff and families to just want what's best for our children. And I think that's, that's the silver lining, just to be able to see that um, and know that people want the very best for all of our kids in Connecticut. So Fran, thank you. Hey, Fran, thank you so much. You know, when, um, when you became the executive director, I have to tell you, as someone who served on the education committee since 2011, everyone on the committee was so thrilled. I mean, and, and your commitment to the, our kids or kids throughout the state and your, your professional professionalism and your experience. I can't thank you enough. I want the people of Madison and Durham thank to you. Hear, hear from you a perspective <laughs> that's just this, these decisions are not being made really based just what their board of eds think. It's really with all this knowledge behind them and with people like you working on to provide that knowledge and that information. Thank so you, Fran, Maureen. Anytime. Anytime. Fran, thank I, you so I respect you so much. You're such an education advocate. Thank you. Fran, you know, it's important to me, but it's important, it's important to our communities. And it's, you know, everything, look at all the problems we have in Connecticut. Oh and my always, goodness. And I always say education's the number one way out of it. In, Absolutely, in way. So, I agree. Um, some other time we'll talk about our tech schools and things like that, things we're trying to work on with special education. But today I wanted people in the 101st and beyond to just know that what decisions were made are being made with a lot of, lot of basis behind a lot of work and that it's also something that would be a reassess regularly. So Fran, thank Absolutely. you for today. I really Th appreciate it. Thank you, Noreen. And good luck to you. Keep up the good work. And to you as well. Thank you. Thank you.